Welcome to Mix Lab. I'm Joey Sturgis, and today we are talking about dominating with kick drums using EQ. And uh, thank you guys for joining me here. I want to talk about basically what is it that makes a kick drum sound powerful. Uh, so you know, I have a session here, and I want to take a look at that. I've got Cubase, and this session is the session that we did with uh, Drew Folk and Jeff Dunn, and the song is Flag of the Beast with the band Emir. And I really like this song, and uh, Drew and, and uh, Jeff did a really good job mixing it. Essentially what you've got here is like a kick sample. So this kick sample sounds pretty good on its own. Um, I'll show it to you with the EQ turned off. So this is what it sounds like right out of the box. And in the context of the mix, that sounds like this. With a little bit of EQ, it ends up sounding like this. Huge difference with the EQ on there, and you can tell that <laughs> EQ has every ounce of responsibility for making that kick drum sound powerful. So the first thing to really note here is that not all kicks are equal. Some are short, like a burst. Some are really long, more like a timpani. Some are metallic or synthetic, and some are like woody or round, I would almost describe them as. Thing about this is that each one of these require a completely different EQ approach. And the thing about EQ and kick drums is that it's really all about balance. So having you know too much treble is going to make the kick sound weak, for example. Too much bass is going to make the kick sound really muddy. If you have the kick too scooped, it's going to sound really hollow and alien-like. And if it's too warm, it'll sound like cardboard. What we really want here is just the right amount of all four of these things to make the kick sound perfect. Now there's one way that I like to approach kick EQ, and this is such a simple way of thinking about it, is first we need to remove all of the problems with the kick sound. And that could be anything from like carving out some stuff, or maybe it's changing the sample. If anything, it's just get rid of as many problems as we can before we start to actually make the kick sound the way we want it to sound. The second part is to then adjust the treble, getting that click just right, you know, getting the, the kick to smack in the right place. And then finally adjusting the bass or the low end. Let's, uh, let's actually jump into the DAW here and show that mentality. So I'm going to reset the EQ. Actually, I like this EQ, so I'm going to save this real quick. Mirror kick sound. That's a good habit, by the way. Let's go ahead and reset this EQ. And the very first thing we're gonna do is solve the problems. So anything that we hear that sounds like a problem, we're gonna try and remove that or solve that first. When I do this, I like to sweep an EQ. So I'll take just one EQ setting and sort of sweep up and increase the gain of uh, whatever I'm listening to so that I can kind of find the spots that are problematic. I'm hearing like a node right here. It sounds kind of like a, an overtone. So I, I would think that that's pr pretty much the first problem right there. Um, I'm going to use this EQ right here to attack that area. Let's increase my cue width. Great. Now let's listen. Wow, that's such a huge difference, especially if you're listening to this like with a subwoofer or something right now, or maybe some really nice headphones. You could totally hear how that ring has completely disappeared. So 
I would liken that to basically fixing the problems first. Um, next, we would want to adju adjust the treble. Now, when I'm working with kick sounds, I like to carve in solo and then add in context. So what that means is like when we're going to add treble to this kick, we're going to do it while listening to the entire mix. So unsolo the kick, hit play, and let's add some treble. Love that. Sounds great. Finally, uh, the, the last step would be to adjust the bass. That's not always the easiest thing to do. There's sometimes you need to do some cuts and some boosts. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a second. But for now, I'm going to do something like this. You'll notice that I like to bypass a lot when I make EQ moves. It's always a good habit to get into. So basically when you're EQing a kick drum, you want to make sure that you don't overdo it. It's so easy to push the kick EQ so far. Um, so don't be afraid to do that. But at the same time, just kind of monitor yourself because you don't want to do something too, too drastic to where it sounds just ridiculous. Now let's get into about how to actually think about kick EQ and I think this will give you the most insight on how to basically dominate with kicks. The first thing is there are no rules. However, we can definitely make a general guideline of how we want to approach EQ and kick drums and all sources are different. So anything that you are going to do with EQ is basically reactive to your source. Finally, EQ is 100% relative to your mix. So the amount of treble that you need in a rock song might be different than a metal song, or it might even be different from one rock song to the next. The anatomy of a kick EQ is, is I like to break it down into three main parts. The first part being the low end, and that's kind of made up of sub and bass, which controls basically the punch of your kick sound. The second part is the mid-range section, which really controls the warmth of your kick sound. And finally, the presence section, which controls the click. Now, when you're adding EQ to a kick, I like to think of this kick EQ additive attribution table, which essentially is just going to break everything up into four different categories. And these are frequency ranges that I think make the most sense based on the words that we're using here. So with the word sub, I would say that's between 20 and 80 hertz. With punch, that's between 80 and 250 hertz. With warmth, that's between 400 hertz and 1.5 kilohertz. And with click, that's between 4,000 hertz and 12,000 hertz. Below this, I've written out what kind of EQ you should use on each one of these. So for sub, I like to use the low shelf, and you can really control that in an additive way. If you want to boost some sub, you want to use a low shelf to do that. With punch, you want to use a parametric EQ to do that. Same thing with warmth. And with click, I like to use either a parametric or high shelf, but when you're using parametric, you want to be very careful to uh, not overdo things and not have such a narrow cue. So with the sub, it's going to be a quick slope uh, cue width. With the punch, narrow cue. With the warmth, medium cue width. And with the click, you want something a little bit more broad stroke like a shelf. Now with kick EQ subtractive, you want to think about this a little differently. You're going to have your frequency ranges change slightly, just a little bit. And you're also going to use a little bit different approach with the EQ tool that you actually do. So the rumble will be between 20 and 80 hertz again. However, this time the mud moves to 100, between 100 and 300 hertz. The cardboard sound comes from around the 500 to 800 hertz area. And the typewriter sound is somewhere between 4,000 and 20,000 hertz, depending on what kind of kick drum you're using. With the rumble, I like to use, again, a low shelf. This time, maybe sometimes a high pass, depending on what you're doing, um, with a very slow slope there. On the mud, I like to use a narrow cue width parametric EQ. With the cardboard, I like to use a medium cue width parametric EQ. And with the typewriter, I like to use a high shelf or a parametric. 
I want you guys to really get in the habit of carving out things that you don't like in solo mode, but adding things that you do like in context. I think the more you do that, uh, the better you're going to understand how to EQ a kick. So let's let's jump into the DAW here and and go back through uh, EQing a kick drum now that we know what we know. So the first thing that we did is we went through and found that that spot that we didn't like. We carved it out in solo and we made sure that our cue width was pretty narrow for carving. That makes a lot of sense. We dealt with some sub problems by adding a shelf and lowering it a tad. So this kind of decreases um, all the sub range frequencies over a range of frequencies rather than you know doing something more like this where it's a petrometric uh, parametric and it's a uh, sort of attacking a specific frequency you don't want to really do this when you're dealing with sub frequencies because the octaves are so close to each other um, that you really just don't get a lot of mileage out of doing that so I would recommend doing it with a shelf like this um, for boosting in the low end I did like to do sort of a medium cue width somewhere around like let's say something like this um, around that 60 hertz area sounded really great and you'll notice that it's not too narrow like this you don't want that it's gonna sound really bizarre that's not how kicks sound normally so we're using like a medium cue width right there and then we did a little bit of boosting up here in this area and you'll notice that I'm using a very wide slow slope here this is a very easy smooth sounding EQ move that you can do to essentially get your kick to sound uh, to, to increase the click uh, in a really natural sounding way because if you were to you know attack it with something like this you're gonna get uh, something that sounds kind of bizarre and also if you're you know going after those really specific frequency ranges like this again you're introducing just a, a really unnatural way of making something sound like it has more high end so I really prefer to do one of these shelves that has a nice slow slope um, such as the high shelf number one here like this so that's pretty much the end of uh, dominating kick drums with EQ if you guys have any questions put them in the comments below uh, and as always thanks for watching